Thank you very much, Pierre, and uh, thank you to Chuak for this invitation, and it's a great pleasure and privilege to be here. I've got some slides which will be coming up, but while they're on their way, uh, I'll just uh, briefly introduce myself. So my name is Lena Ventland. I work in the United Nations Human Rights Office. I head our work on business and human rights. And in that capacity, I worked with Professor John Ruggie uh, for the six years when he was UN Special Representative on Business and Human Rights and developed the uh, U United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And since the endorsement by the UN Human Rights Council of the Guiding Principles, our work has been focused on supporting efforts at implementation of the Guiding Principles, but also trying to facilitate and support the embedding integration of the UN guiding principles in other elements of um, global governance frameworks, um, not least those that are produced in the context of the OECD. Um, next slide. Did you have that? Yeah, I think I do. Um, <coughs> so just for those of you who haven't followed the process of the guiding principles as closely as, as some of the rest of us or some of us, I just want to say a few words in terms of background. <coughs> So basically, Professor John Ruggie, who is in the, in the picture there, was appointed special representative by then Secretary General Kofi Annan on the issue of business and human rights to try and break a deadlock in the international <coughs> human rights discussions about what are the human rights responsibilities of companies. Human rights have been traditionally developed by largely, or they've been developed by governments and largely for governments. But in the last um, decades, um, in the 70s, 80s, with the uh, latest wave of globalization, there was a lot of attention placed to the fact that when business can have large impacts on human rights, what should be their responsibility for, um, for managing those impacts? So uh, there were very divided positions. You had business who, by and large, were completely united, saying human rights have nothing to do with us. The only thing we have to do is to respect the laws, operate within the legal um, frameworks in the countries that we operate, and human rights are only for states. On the other hand, you had civil society who had beginning to give up a bit on states who weren't meeting their own human rights obligations and therefore saying, well, you business, if you can do something about human rights, you should do something about human rights. And those two positions were, were deeply polarized. And governments at the time um, were sitting on the fence, you could say. And they did what many businesses are doing. They outsourced the problem to an independent expert who was appointed by the then UN Commission on Human Rights to try to sort <coughs> that out. So the first mandate Professor Ruggie got in 2005 was basically to identify and clarify standards of corporate responsibility with regard to human rights. What, what was actually, what is this already in the system? But also clarify what are the role, what is the role of states? Because states still, when human rights have the core duties, the core obligations. Um, so Professor Ruggie first spent three years um, engaging very actively with all stakeholders and not least with states to try to, to do this sort of ground clearing and try to sort out what, what should even be the parameters for the discussion. And in 2008, he then presented to the Human Rights Council the Protect, Respect, Remedy framework for business and human rights. And I'll get into a little bit more detail about what the framework is. But basically, the, the framework was a conceptual policy discussion to begin to untangle who has to do what when it comes to business and human rights. And coming from that very deadlocked position, already three years later, there was suddenly agreement, complete agreement amongst governments in the Human Rights Council, amongst the stakeholders. Business liked it. BIAC were amongst the international business organizations that, that endorsed that framework. It was supported by trade unions. It was supported by human rights NGOs. So the government said, well, this is a good beginning. So you go now spend the next three years trying to operationalize this three-pillar framework. And um, so the end of Professor Ruggie's mandate was in 2011 when he presented to the Human Rights Council the UN guiding principles for the implementation of the Protect, Respect, Remedy framework on business and human rights. Um, 
so the three pillars of the framework, the Protect, Respect, Remedy framework, outlines and stipulates the distinct responsibilities that states have, obligations that states have when it comes to, to human rights in the context of business activity. Of course, states have lots of human rights obligations that they have undertaken, they have ratified, ratified conventions, but specifically when it comes to acts by a business that has an impact on business and human rights, or, or on human rights. What is the core obligations that states have? And it's basically the state duty to protect. Protect against human rights impacts caused by business. The second pillar was about the responsibility to respect. So what is the, what is the baseline responsibility that business have for human rights? And Professor Ruggi, through the consultations and through the identification of existing practices and standards um, that were and expectations of business identified the corporate responsibility to respect human rights as the baseline standard of responsibility for all companies. And that basically means to act with due diligence to avoid infringing on human rights. So as you go about doing your business, you must take care that you don't uh, infringe on the rights of others. And where you do cause harm, you need to address whatever harm that you have caused. And the final pillar of the framework importantly um, keeps victims in the picture, those whose rights have been infringed, and identifies that the core right that those whose right, right have been infringed have under international human rights law, under inter, uh, international human rights norms, is a right to have access to an effective remedy. So the third pillar of the framework basically is addressed to states and to business enterprises as well, largely to states, saying that where harm has arisen, you must provide an effective remedy. And the principles then elaborate as to what that remedy looks like. So um, a little bit more on the, on the background here. Um, so the guiding principles, as I said, presented, developed by Professor Ruggie due, uh, due, uh, through a very consultative, inclusive process. We had 47 international consultations over the six years, plus thousands, literally thousands of pages of submissions and research and and discussion and, um, and, and, and documentation put out. And it was unanimously, the guiding principles were unanim unanimously endorsed by the Human Rights Council, which provides them with a strong governmental uh, support and a strong political legitimacy. Again, I don't know how many, how closely many of you follow the UN Human Rights Council, but it's fair to say that they don't agree about very many things when it comes to human rights and the Human Rights Council. But this was really one of the issues where very unusually uh, there was a um, unanimous endorsement. And it was also the first time that governments in the council endorsed a normative document that they had not negotiated themselves. So it was a unique situation. It was also endorsed by leading business organizations, uh, including BIAG and the International Chamber of Commerce, the International Organization of Employers, individual companies, trade unions um, endorsed it. Many um, civil society organizations did so as well, although some said they would have liked to have something more, but they could see that this was a, was a good foundation. So with this political and stakeholder endorsement and support, the guiding principles constitute now the authoritative global reference point uh, on business and human rights, providing an overarching standard and benchmarks for action and accountability when it comes to business and human rights. It's structured around the three pillars, contains 31 principles, 14 are directed at business to implement the framework. I should say that, um, that in the, the the first principle that is directed at states, it says that states must protect against uh, human rights abuses by business, which requires taking appropriate steps to prevent, investigate, punish, and redress such abuse through effective policies, legislation, regulations, and adjudication. There are only two musts in the whole document. Uh, the first pillar um, principle that is directed to states and also about states must provide access to effective remedy. I'll get into a little bit more detail about those musts, but it does signify uh, a sort of legal foundation for, for the principles as they are addressed to states. <clears throat> 
Um, and now I'm completely lost between my notes and my slides. So, uh, okay, I found it. Uh, so just a few um, key features that I think are relevant to the discussion um, that we're having today. Um, so the guiding principles are addressed to all states, um, no, irrespective of exactly which treaties states have on, uh, ratified in the area of, of human rights. It is derived from and reflect existing obligations that all states have undertaken to one degree or another. All states have ratified at least two, but many, often many more, human rights instruments that has language or has provisions to the effect of, of undertaking a duty to protect against impacts by non-state actors like business and to provide remedy where harm has, has been caused. Um, so the guiding principles um, elaborate on ex the existing obligations that states have, um, but do not in themselves create new legal obligations. So it's a, it sort of sits between, uh, it, it, it pulls together a lot of disparate uh, obligations from different legal instruments, elaborate on the legal and policy implications of those instruments. So therefore it is both in a sense a, a, a voluntary document, if you wish, a soft law instrument, but it does indeed sit on top of, of quite, um, quite hard law obligations for states. The guiding principles also apply to all business enterprises, regardless of their size, sector, operational context, ownership, or structure. Research conducted by John Ruggi demonstrated that there is no principled <coughs> basis on which one can exclude certain companies from the scope of application of the responsibility to respect human rights. Even small companies in high-risk sectors can have a very significant impact on human rights. So where do you, how do you, if you were to say, oh, it's only this type of companies or companies in this sector or those that are smaller or those that are bigger, it would just become a mess and, and it was not possible to, to develop, as I said, a principled basis to decide, well, you have this responsibility whereas you don't have it. So the guiding principles then says, well, Every, all companies can have an impact on human rights and therefore all companies, all business enterprise and principle are covered, um, are, fall within the scope of application. Um, similarly, um, for state-owned enterprises um, who act in the market and are engaged in economic activities that can have the same impacts as privately owned companies, they are not excluded from the scope of application of the guiding principles. Why should they be? If you are a victim or if you are affected by the operations of a state owned enterprises, your rights is as much affected as if you were your rights were impacted by a private privately owned companies. So and so doing otherwise, making a distinction between those um, state owned enterprises and, and other enterprises would create an uneven playing field for economic actors. Um, the guiding principles stipulate distinct but complementary responsibilities uh, of states and business enterprises uh, respectively. And it clarifies that the fact that states and businesses are distinct social actors with differentiated roles and responsibilities. And here's where it, where it gets really interesting when you're talking state-owned enterprises, of course, because in, some, in those cases, those distinct roles and responsibilities actually uh, do overlap. Um, in such instances, the state-owned entity carry, and the guiding principles are very explicit about that, in such instances the, the, the state-owned entity carry both the range of human rights obligations of the state as well as the responsibility to respect human rights as stipulated um, in the guiding principles for privately owned companies. So it's, it's, it, it expands the scope because state-owned enterprises are indeed both agents of states or can be considered agent of state or under international law actions of state-owned enterprises to the extent they can be attributed to the state carry the same obligations as state on, as, as the state under international law, but they are also economic actors and therefore cannot and should not be excluded from um, the corporate responsibility to respect. Um, oops. So um, there has been, since the, um, the guiding principles were endorsed by the Human Rights Council, 
and indeed, when it comes to the OECD guidelines for multinational um, multinational enterprises, um, it, it was even before the endorsement, but there's been a convergence across a number of global frameworks and standards that are relevant to the business and human rights debate. Obviously, not all of these standards are, or these organizations that are whose logos are displayed here are, are focused on human rights, let alone on business and human rights. But all of them have to different degrees, standards, frameworks, guidelines, principles that are relevant in the business and human rights context. And they have all, um, and these are just some of the key ones, have, have aligned their frameworks or relevant frameworks with the guiding principles. Most notably was the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises that, that Pierre also alluded to. In fact, the human rights chapter in the updated OECD guidelines are aligned with the guiding principles basically word for word when it comes to the responsibility to respect um, of, of, of companies. There is a very, so that's why in, in a sense it is, it's from the OECD, one is from the OECD, the other one is from the, from the United Nations, but in terms of the substantive, the normative overlap is basically uh, complete when it comes to, um, to, to human rights. And these other organizations, I could go on, and if anyone has a particular interest, I'm very happy to elaborate on, on the type of alignment uh, in relevant frameworks of the other organizations listed there. Um, oh, for me, sake, sorry. <laughs> um, so just, uh, I will, I should have said that from the beginning, we sort of, Margaret and I divided our presentation up, so I will focus largely on the SOE um, guidelines, whereas Margaret would, will speak about the principles. So I've ju I'm just pulling out and want to touch a little bit more on those principles that are particularly relevant in the context of the um, uh, state, uh, of state on enterprises. And I'll, the first one that I will pull out is guiding principle number four, which uh, refers to business enterprises that are owned or controlled by the state. And I've just uh, pulled out the, the relevant language there. According to this principle, state should take additional steps to protect against human rights abuses that arise could arise from the activities of state-owned enterprises. And this indicates an expectation that states and their agents pay particular attention to the risk of adverse human rights impacts, even over and beyond what is expected of some over other government agencies due to the close state-business uh, state nexus of, of, uh, in the case of SOEs. The, the commentary, so the guiding principles are, are uh, developed or contains the different principles and then there is an official commentary uh, text that associates that, that elaborates a little bit more on the, on the meaning of the principles. And the commentary to principle four notes that where a business enterprise is controlled by the state or where its acts can be attributed otherwise to the state, an abuse of human rights by the business enterprise may entail a violation of the state's own international law obligations. And the commentary also specifies that these enterprises are also subject to, as I mentioned already, to the corporate responsibility to respect. And given these risks, agents, uh, um, these SOEs should, be encour should encourage, the state should encourage and where appropriate require human rights due diligence by the, the business entities. A requirement for human rights due diligence is most likely to be appropriate where the nature of the business operations of the particular SOE or the operating context pose significant risks to human rights. So again, there is some leeway, there, but there is a, an assessment that needs to be done, and if an initial assessment reveals that there might be a significant risk to human rights, it is appropriate to require that a, a, a human rights due diligence is, is undertaken. Another uh, element of the guiding principles I want to touch on uh, for this discussion, because I think it is important, is the issue of policy coherence. Principle 8 provides that states should ensure that government departments and agencies are aware of and observe the state's human rights obligations when fulfilling their respective mandates. So this is obviously a principle that goes beyond the SOE context, but is more broadly about um, policy coherence across different government entities and departments. 
And I think all of us in this room, I think we probably all of us come from relatively big organizations, um, recognize the challenge of policy coherence. It's certainly something that I recognize from, from within the UN. But it is a key issue as well as a challenge. Without policy coherence, both international and national standards and policies can be undermined by the very same governments who signed onto them in the first place. And for OECD countries, there is perhaps a particularly high degree of overlap between the human rights commitments undertaken in such bodies as the United Nations and in regional human rights bodies. Most OECD members were part of the consensus in the UN Human Rights Council that endorsed the guiding principles in 2011, either as members of the council themselves or as observer states co-sponsoring the council resolution. And when it comes to the issue of business and human rights, there is an even higher degree of overlap, as we've already touched upon, between the commitments that members of this very organization have under undertaken. And I'm thinking, of course, of the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, which all members of the OECD has agreed to, and which is fully aligned with the UN guiding principles when it comes to human rights. The Working Party on Responsible Business Conduct is deeply engaged in efforts to implement the, UN, uh, the OECD guidelines, for example, how, exploring how they can be applied in the financial um, sector. And I would urge all of you who are working in other parts of the, the OECD to be, to be aware of this. Um, I'm, I'm struck by, I was actually here last week to present to the, um, to the Export Credit Group and, um, and I, I was presenting also on the OECD guidelines, and I was saying, why, why do I have to come and present on the OECD guidelines? Because there's a committee meeting next door who might be more relevant uh, to actually present about that. So I think, like all big organizations, I think there's a challenge within the OECD when it comes to, to policy coherence. But I think the case can be made perhaps even stronger than most other organizations for why they really need and should be um, policy coherence. Um, just um, moving on, so the corporate responsibility to respect, uh, what does that entail? It entail, uh, as I said already, the corporate responsibility to respect human rights also applies to um, uh, uh, um, State on enterprises. It's um, it's the guiding principles. Fifteen sets out what really it it means in practice. So the standard is you must avoid infringing on on rights and have have um, and have uh, and address those rights that that are impacted. But that means in practice having appropriate policies and processes in place to ensure that you know and show that you are meeting that responsibility. And that's why I think discussions uh, like today about the SOE guidelines and the principles, that is where the rubber hits the road when it comes to the interface between the guiding principles and the discussion we're having. having. It's about what are the policies and processes that need to be integrated at all levels of the company in order to ensure that the company is able to identify its human rights risks as per the UN guiding principles, as per the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises and be able to respond effectively to manage, prevent, mitigate, and address any risks that have been um, identified. So I think that is an important point. Um, the guiding principles stipulate what these processes need to be. And again, what it looks like in practice will vary within the individual company, depending on the size, the sector, the operational context. But for all enterprises, there need to be a policy commitment from the enterprise to respect, to meet the responsibility to respect. There needs to be a human rights due diligence process appropriate to the, the size, circumstances, and sector, et cetera, to identify, prevent, and mitigate, and account for how uh, impacts are addressed. And then finally, processes to enable remediation where um, where the enterprise has identified through its human rights due diligence process that there has been adverse impacts. So these are, again, these are guiding principles. Each, the, what it looks like and which departments in a particular enterprise will need to do what and need to be, that is specific to the individual enterprises. But the principles apply to all 
regardless of size, ownership, and structure. Um, abrupt ending. I will now <laughs> just say, um, yeah, that I will say thank you for your attention. I think it is very important to be aware of these responsibilities. I think they are relevant. They are, they are, they are referenced in the SOE, in the, the draft that is out for discussion. But I do think there are a number of places. I didn't take my brief to go through, and I'm that would require a little bit um, uh, more internal processes on my part to provide detailed comments on the actual draft. But I can certainly point, there are certainly a number of areas where it would be very relevant to try to make the connections between these different um, instruments much more explicit. So I will be happy to discuss further. Uh, thank you, Lean. I'm sure that we have a, a questions uh, to raise with you. Uh, I would certainly, but I, at the same time, I've, I've spoken a lot, so I'll, 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 I'll try to. Uh, what I would suggest to is, uh, Margaret, that uh, uh, you take uh, uh, you take the floor, and then we will have a a, a, a Q&A session afterwards. Uh, uh, together jointly, if that's a, if that's okay. a plan. Okay. Thank